Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today as we discuss developing and implementing PIPs for compliance with the home health COPs. My name is Megan Henry, Senior Marketing Manager for Healthcare First, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items, items to ensure that your webinar experience is a good one. You've joined today's webinar listening through your computer speaker system by default. What that means is if you can hear music through your your computer, you will be able to hear this presentation. However, if you'd like to call in using the telephone, just locate your audio pane and select phone. The dial-in information and access code will then be displayed. You have the ability to ask questions using your questions pane. Simply type in your question and click send. At the end of today's presentation, we will do a Q&A session and take as many questions as we have time for. The handout for this webinar can be obtained within GoToWebinar. Just locate the Handouts pane in the Control Panel and select the file for download. You can then click the downloaded file to open or save it. And lastly, this webinar is being recorded and we will distribute the recording to attendees following the webinar as well as posting it on our website. Before I turn the presentation over to Mary, I would like to talk to you just a little bit about who we are and why we do what we do. It all started nearly 25 years ago with the vision to deliver innovative, easy to use, and affordable solutions that enable home health and hospice agencies to put patients before paperwork. And to this day, that vision has never changed. We work hand in hand with more than 4,000 agencies just like yours each and every day to understand your unique needs and deliver the solutions you need to succeed. I also wanted to mention our recently announced new exciting news that ResMed, a global leader in connected healthcare solutions, has entered into a definitive agreement to acquire healthcare first. As you can see here, we offer a number of affordable solutions designed to help you maximize your profit, ensure regulatory compliance, and provide quality patient care. This includes First Home Care, our EHR software, coding services, billing services, OASIS review, CAP surveys, and advanced clinical, financial, and executive analytics. Now, I would like to introduce to you our presenters today. Our first presenter is Mary St. Pierre. Mary was previously the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for the National Association for Home Care and Hospice, and since retiring in 2013, she has served as a consultant, providing clinical, operational, and regulatory guidance to the home health industry. Mary will be providing a brief overview of the QAPI standard prior to jumping into the performance improvement projects. Then we will have Liz Silva, Healthcare First Director of Home Health and Hospice. She will be discussing implementing and developing performance improvement projects to help you ensure your compliance with the COPs. Liz is a recognized authority on healthcare data collection, management, and analysis. And she currently manages our clinical, quality measurement, and management products Quality and Avoidable Events Action Boards. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Mary. Thank you very much, Megan, and uh, welcome everyone to this call. I'll be spending just a few minutes going over what the regulatory requirements are, and that's the first section of this, of this presentation. So it'll be an overview of the QAPI cycle, um, then the, the QAPI standards, and, and followed by actions you need to consider. And Liz will talk with you about the tools and resources that can help with your performance improvement programs, give you some examples, and uh, talk about what's next, and followed by an opportunity for you to get, uh, for, present some questions to us. Next slide. Um, the, the condition of participation related to quality assessment performance improvement is 48465. And what that says is every home health agency, as of January, this is the part of the regulation you should be fully immersed in, uh, have your, developed your QAPI program, you have initiated the uh, first steps and the activities, you've identified data that you will be collecting, and the development of the program includes what you will do in each of these parts of the program, as well as a process for evaluating and maintaining that program. And this is to be under the oversight of your, your governing body. It has to reflect your entire 
agency services, and it has to include all of the types of professionals that provide service in your organization as well as aid service. So it's in addition to including the kinds of services provided by these professionals, these individuals have to participate in the QAPI program. Uh, you must identify indicators. You have to uh, make sure you address emergent care and hospitalization. It has to cover the full spectrum of your agency services. And uh, you must be also looking at adverse events and reduction in medical errors. And most importantly, you have to be able to demonstrate to a surveyor that, in fact, you have this program, that you are in, in following through and carrying out all the functions of the program. Next slide. So the uh, under the copy condition, there are uh, several standards. As I mentioned, the program scope has to look at uh, all of your services, and you have to have a goal of improving health outcomes as well as the patient safety and quality of care. And you must be able to measure, analyze, and track quality indicators that you as a home health agency have identified as important for your, your services. Uh, the program data must include measures. First of all, they specify from OASIS, but the other measures are really up to the agency to select and, and, and determine that's appropriate for that particular agency. And you have to be sure you're using data to, make, to uh, determine the effectiveness of the safety in your program, uh, quality of your care, and where you might improve the services that you provide. And again, this data must be approved by the governing body. The um, imp improvement activities have to focus, uh, they are very specific on high risk, high volume, problem prone areas. And so you really want to look at uh, where these problem areas are in your organization and uh, determine what may directly threaten the health and safety of your patients. Uh, in addition to that, you have to be able to analyze the cause and then take steps preventative actions so that these problems will not recur. Uh, you must uh, be able to track your performance and then be sure that steps you take for improvement can, in fact, be sustained across the agency. And adverse events are a really important focus uh, for, for the home health agency. Um, infection prevention and control, CMS very clearly states in the regulations that this infection prevention and control must be part of your copy program. And uh, you must it not only focus on control, but you must focus on prevention. And you must make certain that you're providing education in your infection prevention and control program to staff, patients, as well as caregivers. Next slide. The uh, quality assessment performance improvement part of the regulation, you must develop um, performance improvement projects. And, and that is, as of July, um, you must show that, in fact, you are executing these performance improvement projects. The scope has to be related back to your services, uh, your, your, your the types of patients you serve, as well as the type of care that you are providing to the patients. And you must clearly document that you have these projects underway, uh, why you conducted them, and be able to show that you have progress. And again, the, the, the Home Health Agency's governing body must be responsible for ensuring that uh, the quality improvement, patient safety are defined, implemented, maintained, that the, uh, you address the improved quality patient safety, and that the expectations for patient safety are established, implemented, and maintained. Uh, also added here is a specific reference to the responsibility of the governing body under the QAPI program to look at potential or existing cases of fraud, waste, or abuse, and that, in fact, you address these. 
Now with this, I'm going to turn, um, turn it over to, to Liz, who's going to provide you with some real specific thoughts, ideas, and, and materials that can help you implement this second phase, this quality, um, this performance improvement program that you must undertake as of July. Thank you so much, Mary, and uh, I appreciate that. I think it establishes a really good um, base for us to talk about. Um, and I, I wanted to start a discussion here about QAPI and, and PIPs by taking a look at this diagram. And this comes from the QAPI requirement, which was a manual that was authored by Heather Wilson, Melanie Merriman, and Martha Tecca. And it was originally intended for hospice QAPI, but I really like to use it as a visualization here when I'm uh, happen to be talking about QAPI, regardless of what line of business, whether it's hospice, home health, or whatever, because it really, it, it does encompass and cover both, or pretty much the whole QAPI um, concept here. It's a, it's a good visual for two important pieces of QAPI. It's a combination of two complementary approaches to quality management, so you've got the quality assurance on the left side, which is really about meeting the quality standards and assuring that care reaches an acceptable level, and it's more reactive and retrospective. But then on the right, you have performance improvement, which is more proactive, and it's a continuous process. And um, with the intention to prevent or decrease the likelihood of problems. So that's one piece. The second piece is it really is a dynamic process. It's not just a one and done, but QAPI is something that really truly is ongoing. And this double cycle here really gives that impression. And um, we're going to walk through an example in a, a moment. Um, uh, in a little bit, and we're going to start by talking about this. So I'm not going to go through each of these pieces, but I just wanted to use it to set the stage, I guess, here when we're talking about the two different components, the QA and the PI, and how they come together into this dynamic process now. So now that we've sort of established that groundwork, we're going to take a look at the five QAPI standards that Mary has described and start to talk about some of the actions that you might consider when you're looking to approach or address each of them. So starting a little bit in a different order than Mary went through, but starting with that executive responsibility. Um, and again, uh, reinforcing this because I think these are all important takeaways that you've, the governing body really is responsible for your agency's QAPI program. And it's not just uh, sort of that QAPI department that's got to manage it. Your governing body needs to be in, included in that. And that includes establishing and maintaining an ongoing agency-wide program, making sure QAPI efforts are prioritized and evaluated for effectiveness so what you're doing actually makes sense. Um, and making sure that the patient safety is pulled into it and you have clear expectations there, as Mary mentioned, addressing fraud and waste wherever appropriate so that the appropriate resources are still being focused and dedicated towards providing quality patient care. And then making sure that you maintain that documentation of your QAPI program. So ways or actions to consider ways you might uh, address this is making sure that you develop, implement, and maintain QAPI policies and procedures. And from the executive or top down or top level here, making sure you establish a culture of quality that from the very top of your organization, all employees can see that QAPI, the efforts are really supported. Um, and a lot of that involves encouraging open communication and respectful communication with suggestions and uh, anything that comes your way for um, suggestions of how, what might need to be addressed. You also want to make sure that your agency vision, mission, values, pr purpose statements, all of those types of things incorporate QAPI as well. Um, and you want to make sure that you have appropriate resources to provide to the QAPI team. And again, making sure that all staff are involved, they're aware, and that you take the time to educate them, whether they're paid, volunteer, or contracted, about QAPI and your QAPI program. For the pro program scope, you need to demonstrate measurable improvement for indicators that are going to focus on health outcomes, patient safety, and quality care. So lots of uh, options there listed, and you need to be able to measure, analyze, and track these quality indicators, and again, including adverse events. That's an important piece. I think a lot of times people just sort of 
there are a lot of uh, areas that are assumed you do well, um, but really if it's not measured, it's not being managed. And so that's an important piece to make sure that you are able to capture that data that you need. So again, going back to um, how to address this, education is a big piece. Um, and reassuring staff about Quapi. I think um, at least initially when Quapi went into place, there, there was a, a perception, misperception, that um, it's really, it could be a more punitive type of process, but it's really about identifying gaps, about lessons learned, and being able to identify opportunities for improvement, really more about the systems and processes versus individual imp uh, performance on something. And so that's an important piece so that staff doesn't think that suddenly uh, Big Brother's watching and, you know, it, it's really about how do you improve the care for the patient. You want to make sure you take advantage of all available data sources, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more as well and review and organize um, your current processes. So look at what you're currently doing for tracking adverse events. Um, is this something that's maintainable? Does it meet QAPI standards? How do you capture data for complaints? Those types of things you want to be able to incorporate here as well. When we look at program data, again, going back to take advantage of and utilize all available data sources. Um, and as Mary mentioned, you want to focus your QAPI efforts on those high priority areas and other agency specific goals as well. You want to analyze your data um, to be able to identify those areas of concern or really your opportunities for improvement. And um, um, Basically, when you're looking at that, you need to identify how do you compare, and then you want to look at how you compare nationally, regionally, as well as internally. And then finally, monitor safety and quality of care that your agency provides. How do you address um, this? Again, we mentioned the different types of available data that you want, or different you want to be able to access different types of data. And these are just some examples of the data. There really is a lot out there, both external data and internal data. So um, externally, you've got all the publicly reported outcomes. You can go to Home Health Compare, reports on CASPER, OASIS data, HHCAPS data. And if you're using uh, vendors, obviously for HHCAPS you need to, but um, other vendors specific comparisons and benchmarks are great to pull in um, to your QAPI program as well. For internal data, you've got on-call logs, you've got complaint logs, the, your assessments, chart audits. We talked about the avoidable events, which incorporate um, the uh, med errors, adverse drug events, infections, patient complaints, falls, all of that. And also looking at your clinical and operational processes. All of these data sources can really help drive and make your uh, QAPI program really data driven. So how do you, some actions to consider to address program data. Really take the time to review, compare, and interpret the data from multiple sources. Um, as we just pointed out, there's a lot of data out there. Take advantage of it. Make sure that you have access to it. And again, on an ongoing basis, something that is realistically um, achievable or attainable for that data. You want to not have something that's going to take a lot of resources to pull together in a way that you can uh, be able to look at it and interpret it, but take advantage of what's out there and ready for you to use. Use that data to help you establish and identify comparative benchmarks. And um, from those, tr you, those benchmarks, using that to help you set your own internal performance targets. And I've listed that a little lower here as well. But those really should be based off your current performance and those comparative benchmarks with something that's a stretch goal that you, could, you, you have to work at to achieve but still is achievable. You want to determine who is involved in the data collection plan, what data you're getting, and how often, and prioritize those opportunities for improvement. You may, when you start looking at it, find there are lots of opportunities, so you want to focus on those um, high-risk, problem-prone areas, and also look for alignment within any current initiatives that you have going on. 
You want to set performance goals, as I measured, mentioned, and measure your progress. So again, it's an ongoing measurement. You need to be able to track and see how you're progressing towards those goals. And that's really important. If you have a, a difficult stretch goal that maybe is kind of far off in points from where you are, percentage points from where you are now, being able to look at progress over time can be extremely helpful as you're trying to keep your staff motivated on why this is an important piece to work on. And I really, I can't stress this piece enough, but make sure to gather data and additional input from your staff and your patients. Your staff may have some really great input, sort of uh, alternative or out of the, outside of the box ways to identify issues or measure progress or identify opportunities. Um, and, you know, in many cases when we're talking about patient care, they're the ones in the field, so it's really worth taking some time to hear what their input is about the, the different data that's available and how to capture it as well. And then looking at program activities. And here, um, you need to be able to establish a QAPI team um, that's going to be able to review, analyze, and provide feedback. And you want to, again, determine the frequency and detail of the data that you're get, capturing and make sure it is analyzed and identify who's going to do it, what data needs to be, what measures need to be analyzed, when it's going to be captured, how often you're going to report it, all of those things need to be incorporated here. Documentation, again, is key to make sure that you um, capture that and have sort of proof of your QAPI program. And again, you want to make sure you're able to focus your efforts on those high risk, um, it, those areas that have a significant risk to patient health or safety, um, high volume, which are for actions or processes that frequently provide, um, that are frequently provided to a larger patient population, problem prone areas that might result in negative outcomes that are associated um, with um, negative outcomes just associated with different um, uh, demographics. Um, you want to be able to trend those results and compare benchmarks, whether it's, um, and that's something we'll look at also here um, in a moment. Um, and then adverse events, again, those negative or unexpected events that impact the plan, may impact the plan of care um, and or contribute to the decline of the patient. Those are some of those areas that you really want to make sure to focus on. And again, making sure improvements are sustainable over time. So once you reach your goal, it's not a matter of just dropping in and move on. You need to make sure that whatever benefits you've uh, achieved, you can continue to, to sustain. So ways to uh, pull this together, you want to use a formal systemic process um, to be able to identify the key drivers and causes of performance. Um, that's a really important piece to identify what is driving your performance so that you can address those areas uh, to make improvements in your scores. You want to incorporate your clinical standards. You want to implement changes that are going to result in improvement. Again, that's part of the focusing your, um, your efforts on the sort of the right um, PIPs to study. Again, you want to make sure that you're looking at ways that you can sustain improvement versus just real quick Band-Aid fixes. Um, and it's really important that if you identify a process and you have um, an idea of a way to address it, you want to make sure to sort of do an internal beta test or do a little pilot program in, internally before you implement something agency-wide. It just prevents um, it allows you to sort of work the bugs out of it before you sort of release it to everybody in your, your agency, um, and that really helps with buy-in. And then also want to make sure that you're reviewing the QAPI plan every year. It will need to be uh, modified and updated, and that's all part of that dynamic process. Now, the last one, the, the um, QAPI standard for the performance improvement projects. You want to conduct these at least annually, and you need these, really want these to be data-driven, um, to contribute to data-driven decision-making, and have your prioritization of the different projects be based on the data that you have, not just gut reactions or um, thoughts of whoever's in the room, what they think is most important, but understand what the data is behind it. Use those um, problem-prone areas, high risk, high volume to help you prioritize, as we've mentioned, 
and make sure to identify the resources and tools that you need. Those resources can be um, money, can be um, bodies <laughs> to help with it, or it could be um, systems, those types of things to make sure that you know what is needed. You may already have them in place, but it's good to make sure that you identify exactly what is going to be needed for you to be able to capture and report your results on an ongoing basis, at least quarterly to the QAPI committee, but um, more frequently, uh, typically people will look at results on a monthly basis and then roll that up together on a, at least a, a quarterly basis. And again, make sure you document, review, and analyze your progress. So actions to consider as you're implementing this, and this goes back to where I sort of started talking about this, um, you really want to look at each PIP as a learning experience. What are the lessons learned? What are the systems or processes that you can improve upon or, again, versus individual personnel's performance? Um, make sure to incorporate a project timeline that has specific time frames built into it for reporting to leadership so it's very clear when that needs to happen. Um, again, making sure you identify those tools and resources, and make sure to develop an efficient way to report and present the results to your executive leadership. And by efficient, I mean uh, you can pull together data for a one-time thing. Uh, it may take hours and hours and hours to pull it together and aggregate it in the right way, but you can do that for a one-time presentation. If this is something you're going to need to do on an ongoing basis, you really want to make sure that you have a relatively easy way or you build processes in that makes it easy for you to get the data out and put it in a format that's going to make sense to who you're presenting to. Um, so taking into consideration if they are visual people, if they're data table people, if they're report people, you need to make sure that you're presenting it in a way that everyone on the team is going to understand um, and be able to interpret and utilize that information. And most importantly, you have to be flexible. You've got to be prepared to modify your projects, and um, we're going to talk about that again when we talk about the QAPI cycle in a moment, because it is a dynamic, ever-changing, ongoing process that does require you to look at and identify additional gaps and, and identify additional or, or different approaches to being able to address um, each step in the QAPI cycle. Now, one of the pieces that's important to um, pull in is you want to make sure that you, within a um, quality improvement plan or a performance improvement plan, there are specific components that are going to be addressed. So you want to have a statement of that quality vision, um, a description of the program, the, the project structure. You want to make sure that you have that diverse QAPI team or committee in place. You want to have a regular ongoing meeting schedule that's in the calendar, everyone knows when it's going to be, and a clearly defined and outlined documented process for how that um, uh, performance improvement project is going to be conducted. You want to make sure it has a list of all improvement goals that you're going to be working towards um, and make sure that they're measurable, achievable is also a big piece, and relevant to the project and within a, a specific time frame. You want to make sure there's a plan in place for evaluating the overall project and the goals and again being flexible if you need to change those and make sure you have that process in place for acquiring and reporting your performance data out. Now just as a reminder CMS uh, has not specified and does not require a specific format or template for your PIPs. So you have some flexibility um, to create PIPs that are truly unique and meaningful to your individual agency as long as you're able to address the, the, the five um, standards there. So your QAPI team or committee um, should have, and I want to preface this by saying you need to scale this based on the size of your organization, but optimal number of individuals is about five to eight folks on your QAPI team, and you should have at least one member from um, each of the following here. So uh, with your clinical leadership, and this person is going to be the one who has the authority to, to test and implement a change um, and to problem solve the issues that arise in the process. 
Um, that's the individual that's going to understand how the changes are going to affect the clinical care processes and the impact that these changes from the PIP may have on other parts of the organization. From technical expertise, this is the person that really has a deep knowledge about the process or area in question. Um, a team may need several forms of te technical expertise, um, including um, technical expertise in QI processes, health, your, your EMR or health information technology systems, um, and the, how they are going to come together to support that proposed change, and the specific areas of care that you're looking at. Day-to-day -day leadership, um, this is the individual that's going to basically lead the QAPI team and make sure that the team stays on task um, and that your the tasks are being performed like the data collection, analysis, and um, making sure the implementation of the change is, is occurring as well. Best person really has to work well in, with others and closely with other members of the team and be able to understand the full impact of the team's activities on other parts of the organization as well as just what they are specifically targeting. Project sponsorship, this is going to be the individual who has the executive authority and serves as the link to the QAPI team and the organization's senior management. Um, and although the individual does not participate on a daily basis with the team, he or she may join in periodically and definitely stays aware of its progress. When needed, this person can also assist the team in obtaining just additional resources or helping to overcome any challenges or barriers that they account, encounter when they're implementing uh, the improvement processes. So, okay, I want to just um, take a moment to talk about some of the different tools and resources that are available. And I'm not going to read through this list right now. There's um, obviously a list of some of the tools that are out there. Um, but we're going to review several of these in this next section here. And I wanted to start by talking about some of the tools that CMS has available on their, uh, and these happen to be on their nursing home QAPI page. And while they're not specific to home health, they really are applicable to essentially any line of business. And I think they're, they're uh, really valuable tools to take advantage of. So, um, and I'm, they're listed here, but we're going to talk about each one here as well. So starting with uh, PIP Charter, this is going to establish the goals, scope, timing, milestones, and team roles and responsibilities for the performance improvement project. So you've got list out the name, the problems that need to be solved, their problem, the background of why is the project needed, what are you trying to achieve, what are your goals, um, what is the scope of the project so that you don't start um, having sort of a squirrel moment and having it continue to expand and sort of get out of control. You want to try and keep it as uh, contained and defined as possible. You want to make sure that you're defining there you have access to the phases or the time frames, the start and end dates for the different components of it, and understand who's on the team and what their responsibilities are. What resources or materials are needed, um, and again that can be software, people, equipment, supplies, lots of different um, things kind of qualify there. And then also understand what what could be a barrier, what could be a challenge or a blocker for you, and what are you going to be able to do about it. Now the PIP launch checklist is another great tool, and this it really just has some helpful hints to ensure that you've covered all the important steps as you're launching or before you launch a PIP. So just to walk through um, and ensure you've got everything covered. So it is um, broken down, this one is broken down into three sections, looking at project stakeholders and team members, and it lists out some individual just line items or things that need to happen. And it's intended to be used by the PIP leader. So again, we've got the stakeholder and team members, you've got the project resources and the project process. So just different checklists, obviously these are going to um, make change depending on the process itself um, and what the PIP is, but it's a good way to just make sure you've covered all your bases before you jump into it. A PIP inventory is really just a high-level tracking uh, tool, basically to list out all the PIPs within your organization. So pretty straightforward, but it provides a high-level visualization of all the things you've got going on. 
And then the sustainability decision guide is a series of questions to help leaders determine um, if the interventions that have been made or that they're putting in place are really sustainable. So under systems, some examples here is, have the systems been revised to encourage this new action? Are there identifiable roadblocks? And again, what are we gonna do about them? Um, has the change been incorporated into your new employee training? So get them from the, the get-go to make sure that they're doing this new process in the right way. Do you have strong leadership to support the change? Are there current champions who are doing really well for this change or really eager for it that can help support it out on the ground level? Um, is the workplace culture um, supportive of all of this or are there issues that need to be addressed before you can really permanently Im implement the changes that you're looking for? And um, has ongoing measurement and review been scheduled to make sure that the changes are adopted correctly. So not just as you implement it, but you need to keep going throughout the whole process. Storyboard guide for PIPs is really um, a way to simply and clearly communicate the story of a PIP. So um, one sentence, just brief descriptions about the problem, what's the issue, um, what are you hoping to achieve, what is the description of the change that you're trying to introduce and, and make? What are the measures and uh, or indicators that you're gonna be monitoring? And what are the results? So just a high level, almost poster board presentation about this with just one to two sentences about the results. What did you learn from it? And what are your next steps to make sure that you can do this in an ongoing way? Now, moving on from the CMS tools, I'm gonna to start with the five whys tool. And this is really a, a really pretty simple, yet pretty insightful way to get to the root cause of an issue. And particularly when you're addressing a chronic or ongoing issue. And really, it's just about asking why five times to get to the root cause. So here's the, the initial piece. You have um, a patient that received the wrong medicine. So you're gonna ask why why did the patient receive the wrong medicine? And um, it, the answer may have been that the nurse didn't complete the patient identification. Well, why didn't they um, complete it? Well, the patient didn't have a wristband. Well, why didn't the patient have a wristband? Well, the wristband had been removed for a procedure and not replaced. Okay, so why was the wristband not replaced? It's because the printer wasn't working that prints out the wristbands. So why wasn't the printer working? Well, the IT staff um, had been reduced and is, was overworked and just couldn't get to it. So this then leads you to what can you do about it? What are the actions that can be taken to address this and sort of work your way back? So it, it just helps you dig deeper into the issue by simply asking that question why. These next three, brainstorming, affinity grouping, and multi-voting are all kind of similar, and so I've put them here on one slide, but brainstorming is really just sharing ideas, and the important thing is to make it constructive and not, uh, it's not a forum for discussion or um, rating or complimenting or criticizing ideas, just getting them out there. Record all the ideas and, and encourage people to think outside the box, be, a box, be creative. Make sure to clarify the ideas so everyone's clear about what they mean, but and you can get rid of duplicates there. Now, if you have it, depending on how this information is captured, sometimes people will put them on sticky notes, individual cards. Once you do that, then you wanna randomly place them on a board and then group them into ideas that seem to be related. Um, and you wanna basically discuss those groups at a time so you have no more than 10 groups as a, a whole out of all of your brainstorming. And then to focus it further, you can do um, multi-voting, which each participant, and there are a number of different ways you can do this, but each participant is gonna vote for three ideas. And you're basically gonna weed out the ones that got the fewest uh, votes. And again, that is gonna help you prioritize what areas you might need to look at. Another tool here is the cause and effect diagram, which also can be referred to as the fishbone diagram. And it basically gonna write down the effect that you wanna influence on the far right there, um, and then draw a horizontal line, and then you have all the different diagonal lines coming in where you can put additional details. Um, 
and those sort of create the fish bones and you want to label the end of each of those with the categories that you've chosen to address so in this example it's got people environment materials methods and equipment but those obviously will change based on what you are looking at um, so it's it's just an alternative way that you can identify sort of what is coming together to drive that performance that you are currently trying to make a change in. This is a template for a driver diagram and it's intended to show the relationship between your overall goal or aim of the project and then the primary drivers. There should be about two to five and those are sort of the most important influences. And then from those sort of weed out to show a number of different um, secondary drivers and those are sort of the natural subsections of those primary drivers um, and it really just and then again you go to the specific ideas that you want to test or what you want to make changes to and again making sure you get input from your team on these particularly when you get to the specific ideas that can be a really valuable piece we're going to look at this diagram in the example as well um, in just a few moments now the FMEA or failure modes and effects analysis is uh, what one of my colleagues uh, at one point called the pessimist's view. And you basically want to identify anything that could possibly go wrong and then identify the plans that you might be able to put in place to prevent them from happening. So it's really a proactive way of looking at it. You want to um, analyze the process ahead of time. And this is the best approach if you're looking at issues that can result in harm to the patient or increase that risk. Um, so obviously you want to try and prevent that versus and be proactive versus reacting to it. So what could go wrong? Why would that specific failure happen? And what could be the consequences of that? And then being able to address ways to prevent all of that from happening. This is just an example in your um, in your handout here of uh, how sort of that template can work um, using a medication dispensing process as an example. So um, the steps in the process, you've got orders are written for new medications. What was one failure mode? The first dose um, may be given to the pharmacist review, uh, may be given prior to the pharmacist review of the orders that can cause medication ordered um, that it may not be available or easily accessed in the dispensing machines because it was before the review. The effect of that is that the patient may receive incorrect medication, incorrect dose, or a dose via a different route. So you then are going to assign a likelihood of it happening, a likelihood of detecting it, the severity of that type of failure, and a risk-prone number to identify sort of the overall impact. And then again, what actions could you take to reduce that from occurring? Flowcharts or process maps is another great tool to use, and it's a pretty simple one, and it provides a good visualization of the different steps in your process. And when you're looking to put a PIP in place, it's really important that you understand the current process. You've got to know what's going on now in order to be able to implement changes. So, um, mapping, taking the time to map out the current processes is a really important piece and then you can modify that to address your, um, the improvements that you want to put in place. A histogram is another one, depending on the type of data you're looking at. This is a bar chart that's going to display, in this case, the variation um, in continuous data. So over time, whether you're looking at time, weight, size, temperature, things that um, really are ongoing or continuous and so here it's looking at turnaround time and the number of days and you can get a sense of um, order turnaround or, or uh, um, I, whatever this particular topic may have been how quickly you can get a turnaround of something based on these number of days can help you identify where the biggest risk is one of the most commonly used or talked about is the PDCA or PDSA depending on which one you uh, think of it as whether it's Plan Do Check Act or Plan Do Study Act, they really are uh, pretty much the same. So you basically under the plan want to identify that root cause, um, plan the test and develop your action plan. Under the do, that's where you're going to run that test, implement your interventions and, and figure out what's happening. The check or study is where you're going to measure your results and audit your performance. And then act 
is what do you have to do next? What's the next step in this? What do you want to adopt or abandon out of your performance improvement project? So just uh, it's similar to the QAPI cycle, but just a little sort of obviously fewer steps in it, but a good ongoing, you can see from the arrows in the center, ongoing process that changes. This is just an example of a template that you could use to, when you're planning your PIP. So it identifies the team, the project name, you list out the drivers of what you're going to be working on, the measures, your goals, and then down below, what ideas are you going to look at that are going to address each of those drivers? Um, what do you have to do to prepare for that testing? What's involved with the PDCA or PDSA? And who's going to be doing it? And then you have that timeline, the time frame there to identify when you're going to be testing, when you're going to be implementing it, and when you're going to be measuring for that ongoing sustainability. <clears throat> Run charts or control charts are also extremely helpful. They are going to show you performance over time, which is a great way to measure and analyze your performance over time. You may have access to these types of reports through your EMR or analytics vendor or just an internal analytics department, but it's a great way to visually demonstrate improvement in overall trends. The difference with the, the run chart is just the data point, but a control chart is um, sort of a run chart on steroids there where you've got uh, upper and lower control limits that are based on statistical standard deviation calculations away from the mean to identify if they're outliers that fall outside of the upper and lower control limits like July, June and August or July and August um, down below, find out what happened there that fell outside of what was expected from a performance perspective. Okay, so this last section of the presentation is I wanted to walk through an example of how you might be able to use, um, implement a performance improvement cycle here, a process. So coming back to the QAPI cycle as we walk through our example, and we're going to start right in the middle where you you're going to identify your gaps in performance. Um, and you may be at different points in the QA cycle, so you may have already identified your gaps of perform in your performance, and it really depends on the topic. If you've identified an area for improvement that is or can be measured using existing publicly reported measures, you don't need to do much regarding determining or defining the measures themselves or collecting the data because that's already happening. Um, you'll already sort of be moving on to the analyzing um, side on the PI side to um, continue to identify specific gaps in performance and identify um, what's driving that. So you may have identified that you need to improve your scores for one of the HH CAPS comp uh, composite scores, say um, care of patients. And the, the composite measure itself and the component questions, they already exist, and you may need to do some more in-depth analysis to identify which component question you need to focus on. Um, so you want to look at the data that you have available and compare um, compare both internally and externally to, to identify those gaps in performance. Then you can move over to the PI side and figure out what performance improvement projects you're going to implement or develop to address those specific gaps that you want to focus in and target for improving that specific composite score. So just one example here is um, pulling data from um, Home Health Compare. And this is the publicly reported data. You also have it in, pro in provider preview reports, but it's going to show um, the um, this one happens to be on the team communication with patients, shows what your agency score is, external data here is state average and national average, but look at other sources as well to pull in from vendor reports, from just different ways that you can identify what, um, how you're doing and what performance scores should be like. Another example, and this, these um, next few ones are coming from the Healthcare First uh, products. This is from our value-based purchasing dashboard and also part of the First Intel Satisfaction dashboard, where it provides you with this overall look at all of the value-based purchasing quality measures. Um, and it gives you your full year of data. And it, it shows benchmark and threshold scores, and that those follow the CMS definitions for value-based purchasing participants. For those that are not in a home health value-based purchasing um, participating state, 
the same, we use the same methodology, um, but instead of a state-specific data or cohort score, um, we use all of the Healthcare First data as a state cohort. So even if you're not in the value-based purchasing project or um, pilot, you can still use this same information to target and work on what um, CMS is having the value-based purchasing agencies look at. And just for reference, the benchmark is the average of the top 10% of all 2015 provider scores and the threshold is that median or 50th percentile. Um, so here um, you can see if we're just going to pick this particular one, care of patients composite, the exclamation points here are going to identify areas where their score is below the threshold, so below the median. These are areas of opportunity and just in when they prioritize what they wanted to be looking at, this is the particular composite they wanted to target. It can further drill down to get a trend here, so it's, it's not a line, but the columns are still giving you that over time trend. Um, and this particular composite has four individual questions, uh, component questions. Now, this is going to show you've got your uh, benchmark in green and your threshold in red and then each monthly data point. But you still are going to want to get some more information to identify maybe which questions might be driving it. So you want to conduct a brief self-assessment um, once you identify performance gaps and which specific measures have been identified. So what strategies are used in our agency? How consistent are our practices with what we want to be doing? Um, and on an ongoing basis, are we consistent between offices? Um, how would you describe your current process and how well are you doing? How do you compare with others? Um, so when you, when you look at this, it's important when you're looking at your agency processes, how do you educate your staff about internal communication? Is it only at orientation? Do you do ongoing in-services? Is there any formal orientation? Um, this happened to be about a pain uh, communication, but you, know, you can certainly incorporate that for any piece. How does your staff prepare for their visits? Are they doing chart reviews ahead of time? Do they rely on cli uh, clinician updates? Is there a stand-up meeting that they get together with br very briefly first thing in the morning before they go off to visit patients? How do they communicate to other clinicians? Is it only within the EMR or, or patient chart? Do they text and message each other? Do they call? Is there a communication board in the office or a book in the patient's house? And what are your expectations of how quickly documentation should be completed? So again, as I mentioned, the, this composite measure has four different component questions. And you want to not only just look at that composite score, which was low, but drill down and see which of these particular measures may be driving um, that composite score. And you can use that driver diagram as a way um, where you have your aim or goal of increasing your score for that composite. And then the primary drivers could be each of the individual questions. Then identifying, and I just picked question nine here, what are the secondary drivers? So clinical updates, timely documentation, clinician visit preparation, and then specific ideas about how you might test or change um, uh, implement changes here. So look at your process for clinical updates prior to um, a visit start. Alerts to remind or notify the clinician that documentation hasn't been locked or signed. What type of staff ed education could you put in place on processes to require that they prepare appro appropriately for a visit? Just again, just an example of how you might walk through that. And you want to make sure to analyze your data. So here is a snapshot from the um, uh, HHCAPS public reporting dashboard for Healthcare First. Um, and it's looking at the composite and it'll give you a pie chart that breaks down favorable and unfavorable. But it'll give you your monthly trend. And you can sort of see there's a decreasing trend here, but it'll also compare your score with the national. You can further drill down, and this is a little bit harder, but the, the black line sort of right in the middle here is that composite trend. And then each of the colors is a different one of the component questions. Well, right off the bat, it's pretty easy to see that the, this red-ish one is the lowest. And since the composites are essentially like an average, 
that's the one that's going to be, question nine is the one that's going to be driving performance down. And so if you can address that particular question, um, that can certainly have an impact on the overall composite score. And question nine is about whether or not uh, providers um, were informed and kept up to date. And so you can also then drill down further to see the, the monthly trends over a year as well as the reports, uh, your, your score and the national score. So you get a sense of that national average-ish kind of number to what you might want to uh, try to achieve. Um, okay, so one of the things you can use here is a flow chart for that timely documentation component of it. So from the time that you create the clinical documentation, is then you go to the next piece, was the documentation signed um, on the date of the visit? If yes, then that date is ready to be included in your PIP. If not, it's still open and an alert will be triggered by the software system to let the clinician know that they did not uh, lock or sign that document yet. Then it'll check again on one day after the visit, was it um, locked? And um, if yes, then that alert is resolved and then the document is ready or the data is ready for the PIP. If not, it is outside of your, the agency's established processes and so a supervisor has to be involved to manually close that alert so that there's visibility to it and you can address the issue um, either through education or targeting how to improve uh, the timeliness there. Um, this is just an example of filling in the blanks for that project planning form template that I um, mentioned earlier, and I'm not going to go through each of these. It's in your handout as a reference. Um, but make sure that you share these results with your staff. Make it fun. Create a competition with a reward, and I put that loosely in quotes because it's not just about monetary things. It could be a... Um, you know, coffee or it could be an ice cream party or something at the end of different steps so that the team, clinical team with the highest scores or greatest improvement after four weeks gets whatever. But make it, anything you can do to get a better buy-in is definitely worth embracing. So what do you need to do? What's next? You need to implement at least one PIP by July 13th um, to ensure compliance. And so again, just sort of re, revisiting this, you want to make sure to measure all facets of your performance, um, all facets of your agency. You want to make sure that you can improve and prove it in the areas that matter most, that should be prioritized. Um, you need to demonstrate that quality care, that patient goals are being met, um, interventions that you've put in place are effective and patient safety is being ensured. Um, and document leadership by that governing body. That's a big piece, making sure your executive team is involved. And making sure not just the executive team and your QAPI team, but you've got involvement throughout your staff. So um, that is a, a big piece to make sure all levels of your team and your staff are aware and involved in the process. Um, and again, it, it, some of it is as easy as making sure that your team, your staff has access to the HHCAPS results in this case and can be an easy way for staff to get involved. They, those results can and should be easily accessible. And it provides an opportunity to tie those satisfaction results back to improving quality patient care. Um, so different ways that you can get people involved and informed about the whole QAPI process. Um, these are some links, and I just wanted to include, I had mentioned a few different places that I grabbed some resources and tools from in this presentation. Um, and it was listed there, but uh, several of them came from the Quality Improvement Essentials Toolkit on the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, or IHI's website. And um, the other piece I wanted to, I, just if you weren't aware, the another great resource is the um, HHQI best practice intervention packets and they have great uh, information for just different topics or, or subjects to be able to address. Um, okay, so with that we have um, just a few minutes and I'm not sure if I, I feel confident we're not going to address all of <laughs> the questions here but please rest assured that uh, we will address and answer any questions that have been submitted and we'll, we'll um, pass those out uh, 
to those participants as well. Um, but I just want to be respectful of everyone's time because we are at the end of our hour here. Um, I'm just trying to see. Um, Megan, do you want me to do you want me to address any of these, or I'm I'm feeling like some of them are a little bit more long and involved, and it might make more sense to just distribute a handout with the Q and A here. Yep, I think that's probably the best bet. Continue to go ahead and ask your questions. What we'll do is we'll just create a Q and A doc, so when we send out the recording to everyone, we'll attach the Q and A doc, so your questions will be answered. Um, but Liz, Mary, I really do appreciate you guys joining this webinar today, as well as everyone who attended. As a reminder, as I just said, the webinar recording and the handout and the Q&A that we just spoke about will be made available to you in the next week or so. As you log out of this webinar, you're going to see a survey pop up asking for feedback on today's presentation. Please fill this survey out as your feedback is important to us when planning future online events. You can also use that survey to let us know if you're interested in having a Healthcare First representative contact you about our home health products and services. So on behalf of Liz, Mary, and the entire team here at Healthcare First, we want to thank you for joining us today, and we hope that you will join us again for more webinars in the future. Have a great afternoon.